Sir Handel felt none the worse for his adventure, but grumbled dreadfully about being back at work again. A few nights later, he and Scarlet were resting in the sheds when Wendell, one of the works diesels, pushed a flat truck with a small red tender engine into the sidings adjacent to their line. Sir Handel was startled by the engine's size and looked on in disbelief. My word, he exclaimed. Surely he can't be a proper steam engine. He's far too small. The engine scowled at him. You watch your mouth, he warned. I'm the strongest engine on my line. You? snorted Sir Handel. Surely not. I am. And you're lucky that I'm not on that wharf because I died. All right, that's quite enough, you two. Scarloy chuckled, trying to restore order to the situation before Duke arrived back. Remember when Caldy came and enlightened us about mountain railways? This is similar to that, Sir Handel. I recall hearing of a small railway on the island, you know. Duke backed into the shed and he recognised the little engine immediately. That's one of the little engines who helps to rescue me, he smiled fondly. Scullery and Sir Handel, this is Mike. Oh yes, said Mike. I recall now, you're Duke. They built a new line over our old one, Sir Handel, Duke explained. That's where Mike and his friends live and work. Ah, your line was long gone before ours came along though. We run from the port of Arlesborough next to Duck's Branch Line and into the hills. We go past Farquhar Road and by the green. We were brought in to bring away the mine's spoils to use as weed killer ballast, retorted Mike. If only we had known that at the time. Such a shame. But I'm happy here all the same reunited with my old shed mates. Scarloy was growing curious about the old line now. Were there more of you on the mid or then, Duke? Oh yes, Scarloy. Duke recalled fondly. There were a fair number of engines running throughout the lifespan of the Mitsodor, but not all of them remained. Toward the end, there were six of us in service. There was Tim, Jerry, the mine engine, or Miney as we called her, Falcon, Stuart, and myself. Two other engines were scrapped before, and you actually replaced one of them in the early days. The other acquisition from Falcon Works, Albert. Was he as bad as him? Chuckled Mike, referring to Sir Handel, who shot him a dirty look in return. That's enough of your lip, snapped Sir Handel firmly. He knew all about his predecessor's behaviour. His driver on the mid-sodor had worked with Albert beforehand. The driver never spoke well of Albert. Whatever happened to him? He learned his lesson the hard way said Duke, rolling his eyes and sighing deeply as he recalled the unfortunate tale of Albert's downfall. Albert was primarily a goods engine, with a fearsome reputation on the mid sodor and a tendency to be very difficult. His crew often felt the brunt of his temper, and he used to bully them relentlessly. Remember to clean it out properly this time, he barked. I've been choked full of soot and ash all day thanks to your negligence. Duke didn't take kindly to Albert's attitude, and was one of the few engines on the line who would stand up to him. You really have no respect for your crew whatsoever, do you? Who would? 
Albert grimaced. When they can't clean your tubes properly at the end of a day's work, what respect are they due? Engines should work with their crews, Duke said firmly. Your poor attitude will come back and haunt you one day. Mm. I know better. Always have done. Duke said no more. Albert was never one to listen to reason, and he remained steadfast in his belief that he knew better than anyone else, and that included the manager. But there did come a day when Albert would find his ways weren't always the best. It was his last run of the day, and, as usual, he was in a hurry to get back to the sheds. He bustled about the quarry, shunting the trucks fiercely, and bumping them forcefully around the yard, much to the annoyance of the foreman. Be careful, you silly engine! Bumping them like that, and they're liable to break! But Albert took no notice of him. They're dispensable! Horrible, rickety old things! They're not worth the materials they're built with! Well, as long as they carry the materials to the port, then I don't care what you think of them. Now, less of this nonsense and behave yourself. Albert continued to marshal the trucks around the yard, and without much further mishap, he brought them down to the junction to wait for Duke to pass with the picnic. Albert felt crosser still at having to wait. He's taking liberties again. He's late. Calm down, said his driver. He's probably been held up with sheep or something. I should take priority myself and run on anyway. Knowing him, we'd probably clear the section before he even gets here. Duke hurried through, trying to make up for lost time. And soon after, Albert was allowed to start off again. He hurried along the line, intent upon getting back to the yards for what he believed to be a well-earned rest. But his hopes for a clear run through were dashed when his crew began to slow him down at the next station. Driver, why are we stopping? Your tanks are running low, said the fireman. We need more water to keep going. Never mind the water. We've wasted enough time, thanks to Duke, so we'll carry on regardless. The driver and fireman tried to reason with him, but Albert refused to listen. At the station, they tried to brake, but Albert deliberately used the weight of the trucks to keep on rolling and overshot the water tower. They tried in vain to go back, but the weight of the trucks and Albert's lack of cooperation didn't make for easy work. It's no good, said the driver at last. We'll have to try further down. This was the opportunity the trucks had been waiting for. They were tired of being bumped and banged about by Albert, and decided now was the time to pay him out. Duke had arrived safely at the port and had made up sufficient time. Albert shouldn't have been too far behind with his goods, but tonight there was no sign of him. Duke was anxious. For all his faults, he's very punctual. I wonder what's wrong. They soon found out. Albert's fireman came plodding down the line with urgent news for the station master. Albert's overheated. He wouldn't stop for water at the workstation and now he's stuck further up. We'll need Duke to come help shift him. Without delay, Duke hurried off up the line to the point where Albert was standing. The driver had thrown the fire out and was now doing all he could to cool him down. I think it might have been better to listen to your crew for once. Just wait until the manager finds out. He won't be pleased. It was the wretched trucks, Albert wheezed pathetically. They held back and they made things worse than they should have been. We could have managed. You would have managed with more water in the tank, said the fireman firmly. Then we wouldn't have struggled when the trucks began to play up. The driver could only agree with them. I can only hope you've learned your lesson after this. But the lesson had come too late for Albert. You were always a troublesome sort of engine, the manager said firmly. And the damage you've caused to yourself won't be easy to repair either. The inspector says your firebox crown has melted as a result of your foolishness. I apologise, sir, said Albert meekly. I promise it won't happen again. 
Indeed it will not, for we will not be mending you. At least this way, other engines on this railway will learn that a little respect goes a long way. You can be taken apart and used for spares for the others. Good day to you. Albert was put to the back of the shed and taken to bits over time. Duke and the others often felt guilty about accepting his spares, but they also knew that Manager was right in his decision. It's a pity, Duke often thought when he called Albert. He did learn his lesson. Just a shame it was too late.